This is such a wonderful packed house for a Friday holiday evening, and um, thank you all so much for coming out. Um, my name is Chai Vassarelli. I'm a filmmaker, um, and it is my great honor to be here with Vim, who's a personal idol, if not an icon um, of mine, and to talk about this gorgeous, like drippingly gorgeous film. Um, so Vim. Here we are. Here we are. Um, Let's see. So I've long been an admirer of Anselm Kiefer, and um, I feel like he's incredibly unique in how he can con or conjure heaviness in a light way. You know, it, it's like there's like a he somehow like by by looking at something and creating this piece he kind of somehow forgives us for the heaviness of it um and i guess just so that's my observation but my so first off what inspired you to make this film and how long have you known his work do you know you clearly know him personally and just like where was the genesis genesis is on one hand that i really wanted to know more about how his mind worked. And on the other, I knew him for 30 years. And uh, we had become friends on a very short notice. In the film you see an exhibition he had in Germany in 91 at the National Gallery, just before he had a triumphant tour in America, Chicago, Los Angeles, MoMA here and he was the hottest painter on, on the planet, and then he came home and had his big exhibition in Germany, and he was setting that up in Berlin, and it took him three weeks. Maybe you remember, it's with it, all these huge leaden planes, and it was a big show, and he set it up for three weeks, and on his first evening, he went out to look for a place to eat, and he landed in the, the restaurant where I went every night. <laughs> because I was editing, and once I go to a place, I always go back. So I was eating, and in comes this guy who's obviously there for the first time. He looks around, doesn't quite know if this is a place that is fine f with him or for him, smokes a big cigar, which was fine in the place because everybody was smoking anyway. It was 1991. <laughs> I was still a chain smoker myself. He sees there's only one table with a seat, and there's mine, and he sits down. And I realize it's Anselm Kiefer. I did know his work. I'd seen shows. I was at the Documenta in, in Castle, but I never met him. And he recognized me. He has seen, had seen Wings of Desire in Paris, Texas. So we started to talk a little bit shy. And then we were the last people to leave the restaurant, and he asked me, what do you do tomorrow? I said, I'm always here. He said, I come again. We continued that for three weeks, and we became really very close, and we talked like I'd never talked to any other painter in my life. We spoke about everything, and I knew everything about him, and he about me. He knew that I really had wanted to become a painter, and I knew that he had just made a movie and that he was dreaming of making more of them. So in the end, we shook hands on the idea that the two of us were bound to do something together. He also showed me the exhibition on the day when it opened. I read the newspapers and I was shocked. This show that I had really loved and thought was tremendous. It was either totally misunderstood or the Germans had something against him. I don't know. It was one bad review after another, and I thought, how is he going to survive this? I felt really pity for him, and I saw him, and he was at the opening, and he was shocked, and he was, I don't know. A few months later, he moved to France. <laughs> <laughs> Couldn't blame him. But anyway, we kept that dream alive, and every now and then we saw each other and said, we have to do it, you know. 
But I was glad that time was passing because I had no idea how I would make a movie about him. I loved his work and a lot of it was mysterious to me. And that question about the heaviness, these planes are heavier than real planes, they're made of lead. And so heaviness is a strange thing because he does use heavy materials. But I feel that he transcends some of the heavy subjects that he's been treating and he makes, he brings them closer to us. And and if you get involved in his work and if you f follow the leads that he gives you and the quotes of, some of the quotes are from poets that are in his paintings, you s slowly find a way to to be surprised by their lightness and by the lightness of being that he himself carries in himself. So I've always been really curious. I wanted to see him working and I wanted to find out more about this incredible output of his. But I, And we met, we continued meeting, but I at the same time was quite happy that he didn't ask me what about the movie because I didn't know what I would how I could do it, until he invited me in 2019, he called me, hadn't spoken for a long time, and he had a very clear purpose. Vim, you have never been in Bajak. You know now what Bajak means, you've seen it. He said, you've never been there. Uh, no, I said, never been there. You know I've never been there. I've been at his studio and I've seen shows of his, but I've never been in the south of France. He said, you've got to come. Whenever you have a couple of days, please get into a train because don't take a plane that's cumbersome. Come by train and I come pick you up. And I spent a whole day in Bajak. And that day did it for me. I was all on my own. He gave me a map. I walked around with a map saw all this for the first time. It was very smart of his to not guide me, but just l drop me there and says, you, you're going to get along. Everything was open. Every building was open. I could see everything underground, overground. I was completely blown away. And the experience was such that I thought it would be great to be able to pass on that experience. So in the evening when we come together again and he had made something to eat for us, he was alone there, he said, so, when I said, yes, it's now or never, I think. Good talk. And that's really it. We didn't, I said, let's do it. And four or five months later, we started shooting. And I told him, I can't do it in one go. I have to come back several times, and I have to come visit you in Paris. And I don't know how long it will take. And he had only one condition. The condition was, promise me that you'll surprise me. I do have no desire to read a treatment or a script or whatever. Don't show me anything. I will never come to your editing room. Please, one thing. Promise me that you will surprise me. I thought that was a tall order, but, and he put, the tension was on. But I promised. Okay, so that would make me cry. I would be on the floor of my edit room for a long time crying. But that brings us to the question of craft. I mean, the film is absolutely gorgeous. And it's interesting when you watch it. Like for me, I kind of saw the delight in making it. I mean, where the camera is placed every single time. But can you just kind of open it up, like explain it to us about like why 3D, how 3D, how did you actually surprise him? And what was the intention there? It wasn't all delight, I tell you the truth. Oh good, I was heavy scared, stuff. I was scared shitless for a while. But isn't that refreshing? It is scary. Not knowing how to do this is scary. But then again, I thrive on not knowing how to do because that is that is the beauty of what we do, that we can find out how to do it. And I must say, on the first shoot, we shot seven times over two and a half years, and each time ten days. There's not much in the cut from, this first, from the first shoot. Uh, it was like a tourist in his universe. 
But then I slowly understood, and the more we shot, and the, the better I understood how to approach it and how m my language, and my language was the, the medium you just saw, 3D, and you had these glasses on. And that was a great language for me to, to face his universe, because from that first experience on, the first day on that I walked through Bajak, I realized this is maybe not so much a movie, but this needs a translator to pass on that experience to an audience. And I know from all the shows I've seen of Ansem and every piece I know, it touches you when you're there with it and when you're in front of it. And it's more an experience, not only by the size, it's only by the layers and by time that he builds into his work so experience was more the for, for me the key than than something with structure or something that could help you in any other way i really wanted you to be confronted with the work and so my language tried to try to enable you to see this work without opinion. For me, that was almost the most important thing because Ansem does create lots of opinions. A lot of people hate him and a lot of people love him, but everybody loves to immediately start with opinions. And, and I feel, I don't know, I'm, I'm not a filmmaker who conveys an opinion about something. I want to convey my admiration or my respect or my love for something and then I'd rather leave the opinion to you, to the audience. So my job and my craft was really how to, how to make his craft appear in front of you as an experience. You might see the same film again in 2D a lot of people will see it in 2D and maybe they see it on later on on television or on their home video or whatever and they see it flat and it's a different thing. It's still a great movie I feel because I worked hard also on the 2D version but it's not an experience, it's more like a conventional film. It is more storytelling and what you see now in 3D, it was less storytelling and more exposure to an experience. And that's what I thought my task was. And it was tough to find a language because I, I know 3D and I've done it s repeatedly, but this was like the first time I had to learn by doing. It's interesting because I think what you're talking about reminds me of something that I've always taken from Anselm's work itself. Um, like I was recently in London and saw the Finnegan's Wake exhibit at the White Cube. And I keep on thinking about this Japanese concept of wabi-sabi, which is the idea of, you know, it, like, like transition. Like it's this idea of like something that's not permanent, impermanence. And I think that that's experience, right? Like that you have an experience that's very unique, but it doesn't, it's ephemeral. Um, and I guess, like, in terms of the craft itself, you know, you mentioned briefly just now, like, the non-narrative, but how did you find that? I found it through a method that I've never been able to use. I always thought it, would, it might be great, but this is the first time I applied it. I spent... We shot seven times. I spent 10 days with them. I went back and edited for two, three months. I really looked at it every day. I looked at it, looked at it and studied it and tried to understand how I could have done it better and how I could have done it so it was more appropriate. And it's chorus, that was more of a correspondence. And the next time I knew better. And so it was a continuous going back and forth in the editing room shooting, realizing I was I missed that and I missed that, and then going back and 
having fine-tuned my instruments better and slowly the whole thing came together and I had to surprise him so I had to do things that I didn't know before myself so and we had to we, we started the whole thing on a very long in-depth talk because I was convinced I'm not going to ask him any question in the course of the film no talking heads nobody else is going to talk about his work and certainly not himself so I needed to at least get rid of all my questions so we spoke for a, a week every day seven eight hours long conversations about each and every subject that could come up childhood mythology history science all everything i could possibly think of that i might want to know in the course of the film i asked him and then afterwards i had a bible it was 2000 well it was not 2000 uh, first when they printed it out for me it was 2000 i said you have to format it so it's <laughs> half as long so i had a thousand pages and that was everything i needed to know and i never asked him any more questions but in these conversations he gave me quite a lot of um quite a lot of ideas what i can possibly do in order to get that out so when we spoke about childhood for instance i realized that he was one of these people who learned so much as a kid that he was still using it and that he was still thriving on the child he had kept intact in him and if you know him if you get to know him you realize he's actually one of these people who has access to the childhood creativity and i think that's marvelous i always love that when i see, detect the child in somebody and some of the great people i met had that so i didn't dare thinking about shooting with a child but i always wondered how can i get close to that and only the last shoot we then shot with a little boy and shot something that i took lots of liberties on because Anselm had told me first of all he was always by the river and every day he took his bike to the river and was by the river rhine which I knew a lot about because 500 kilometers, kilometers further up north, I was by the same river also every day. And we were living in the same country that didn't exist anymore and tried to reinvent itself. And all that we had in common, but the river was something that I really understood. And then he told me that he loved doing his homework on the stairs of the nearby castle. And I really wondered I didn't know that castle and I really wanted why did he tell me that he repeated it that he went there quite often and did his homework there and then I went there and I realized you saw the castle you've seen it I realized he was not just on the stairs he must have been inside and the guy the caretaker of the of the castle said his aunt was the cleaning lady at the time in the castle so he, he she must have let him in and he must have seen it and anybody who sees that beauty and that richness and that vastness as a kid it must have opened his eyes in an amazing way so I, I mean I didn't ask him I just shot it so it was one of the things that really surprised him it also surprised him that I had shot with his own son <laughs> who who in plays the, yeah, the 30-year-old Anselm, right? The, yeah, let's or, say 40. Or 20, 40, okay. <laughs> Somewhere under 50. Somewhere under 50. He should have been a little bit younger, but... So he plays somewhere around 40. And it, he plays Anselm in a whole, during that decade when not a single art historian, no gallerist, no art person, nobody ever visited him. Sometimes he took his canvases to Dusseldorf and showed them to Joseph Beuys but nobody ever came and saw him work and he pr and he really laid the foundation for his entire work in this time when he's living as an unknown painter his wife earned the living of the family she was a teacher there and he took care of the kids so that kid the older son was always with him and he was always playing under the canvases and 
and under the easels, and he was on the back of his bike when Anselm went to photograph. And it was only through his son that I realized how much he had photographed. And actually that, well, I also find out in the studios that all his, his entire work was photography-based and reality-based in the beginning. So when I asked his son, who had been my main source of information about this time, this bl blank space in the, in the life of Anselm, in the end I asked him to play the part, to play that and be his father, and he was very scared. He said, well, <laughs> I'm not an actor. He said, your father is not an actor either. <laughs> and then he said, I have to call him and ask him. I said, you will not call him. <laughs> I promised <laughs> I was going to surprise him. You're not going to ruin my surprise. This is the director. And your father gave me all liberty, so let's take that liberty. And he was still scared, and he was very, very scared of the moment that his father would see him playing him. But they both survived it. No generational trauma there. Um, actually, <laughs> actually, it made something really fantastic between the two of them. They are much better son and father ever since. I, I mean, that comes across. And I think it brings me kind of to my last question, which is there's something about Anselm's work that is anthropic. You know, it's both dealing with man and what is more than man. And it reminds me, so I think that one, the way you shot that castle is astonishing. You know, because immediately as a viewer, I was able to understand the connection and I think it's that one shot with the mirror in the door, you know, where it's fractured. And it's like, you, you, can, you can kind of see yourself, you can see yourself looking through his young eyes. But, you know, your use of archive, of real archive in this film, as well as the present day, as well as the reenactments, kind of makes me think about the past and the present. And I'm kind of like, as our closing question, I'd be curious if you could speak to kind of what does the present have to learn from the past? Anselm fought his lifetime heroically against forgetting. And the driving force of his art was that fight against forgetting. And, and it's still driving him. And, it's still, and he still has this thing about time, about past and future and present. And I think his main ambition as a painter, I say that, I mean, just comes to me, was to be able to capture time somehow in his painting and in his sculptural work. And he does everything in the book to ruin his paintings. Although, uh, he puts his paintings in an oven for weeks like they're in the Sahara. He puts them on fire, he throws lead on them, dust, ashes. He does everything to ruin them. And in the end you realize the only interest he is, he wants to put time in them, and, and he wants them to be able to speak of time, present, past, future, and they're somewhere in between, and they connect the two. And his effort to fight against forgetting is really a heroic thing, and I must, must, must say, the more we shot and the more time I spent with him, I really realized that was the ethos of his work. And I do respect him so much for it, because I did the opposite. I, I had the same childhood. I had the same, uh, the same impression something was solidly wrong, and there is no future if people do not have a past, and a country with no past cannot be a country. And then you sense it, and you get older, and you understand it. And my reaction was just out. Let me out. I went out into the world and wanted to leave this country behind. And Anselm's reaction was the opposite. He really dig, dug deep, deeper and deeper, and he made himself quite vulnerable this way. And he got bashed a lot for, for this fight against forgetting. So that is something I really learned from it, and that's something I didn't know before. And all of, of all our conversations 30 years ago, I had not known that. I had not realized what the driving force was, and then I realized. Well, this has been so special. So everyone, thank you so much for coming tonight. Thanks a lot, Chai. Anytime. So
As you all know, because you're here tonight, these films really live and die on like word of mouth and sharing it with your friends. So Anselm is opening in theaters in New York today. It opens in LA next weekend, and then it goes throughout the country. But just if you enjoyed it, please spread the word. Um, and I could and not have said this better. Well, that's why I'm doing this. Thank okay. you. Um, and ladies and gentlemen, Vim Vendors. Thank you. Thank you.